Welcome back to the channel. This week, we are going to discuss clinical management of dense invaginators. If you're new to the channel, my name is Siju Jacob. I've been a private practitioner for the past 25 years in Bangalore and Dubai. I've been using a surgical microscope in my private practice for more than 20 years, and I've been training dentists how to incorporate the surgical microscope in everyday clinical practice for more than a decade. Dense invaginatus, also known as tooth within a tooth, is a rare dental malformation and developmental anomaly where there is an infolding of enamel into dentine. Teeth most affected are the maxillary lateral incisors. Now, dense invaginatus isn't something that you see every day in clinical practice. However, when it does occur, it often occurs in the maxillary lateral incisor. Therefore, it is important sometimes to retain this teeth for an extended period of time, especially if the patient is a child. So it is important as a clinician to understand what this clinical condition is and what the options are at your disposal to manage these sort of cases in everyday clinical practice. By the way, I've put together a small PDF which will kind of guide you on how to make clinical decisions when you get a dense invaginators case. I've put the link in the description below. Do have a look. It's a small PDF which you can keep in your clinic and you can use it as a guideline to help you make the right clinical decision when you encounter a dense invaginators case in your clinical practice. Now, when you look at Ola's classification of dense invaginators cases, you can divide it into type 1, 2, and 3. 3 can be further divided into type 3A and type 3B. Type 1 is a partial invagination like you see here. The lesion does not extend past the cemento enamel junction. So it's kind of restricted to the coronal part. It doesn't extend into the cementum usually. Type 2 is partial invagination. However, the lesion extends beyond the crown and into the CEJ. The pulp may be involved, but even if it is involved, it usually remains within the root anatomy. So this invagination usually doesn't communicate with the periodontal ligament outside. Then you have the type 3 cases where it, there is complete invagination. Now, when you say complete invagination, it can be again divided into two types. In type 3A, you have a situation where there is invagination and there is communication of this invagination with the periodontal ligament. Whereas in type 3B, not only is there communication with the periodontal ligament, it also communicates at the apical foramen with the periodontal ligament. So it's like through and through invagination. Now type 1 and type 2 cases are easier to manage because there is no separate communication with the periodontal ligament in most cases. So those are easier to manage. Sometimes if the pulp is involved, then yes, you can manage it endodontically, but the periodontal part is not that difficult to manage. But with type 3 cases, it becomes really difficult. So this discussion, we are going to talk primarily about the type 3 dense invaginators cases and their clinical management. This is how a type 3 a case looks where you have a separate invagination but it doesn't communicate with the usual root canal anatomy here. The invagination or the dense is separate from the rest of the anatomy. Now when this happens, the usual root canal anatomy is vital whereas the dense is responsible for a lesion many times. So when that happens, you can treat this separately. You can see here that's the CBCT with Dr. Andy is taken and in this case what he's done is he just treated the dense alone which means he made a small access into the dense, injected some calcium hydroxide, left it there for some time and then this is a six month recall after obturation and you can see how the lesions responded. So when you treat these sort of cases the rest of the canal can be left alone. The usual canal can be left alone because this tooth will test positive to vitality. So you don't have to do endodontic therapy for the regular part of the canal you just have to treat the dense part. So that's type 3a whereas in type 3b you can see there's complete invagination and then there's communication epically with the epical foramen that looks something like this so it's not just a separate communication with the periodontal ligament it goes through and through and then communicates with the epical foramen so you have a lesion which is through and through so this is the type 3b kind of cases so the first time i treated something like this was maybe seven or eight years into practice and at that time i had no clue how to manage these sort of cases so i just went by instinct the patient was a brother of another endodontist and this patient flew down to Bangalore and we were under pressure to complete the whole treatment in one session because he was flying from quite far away. So this is what I did in my first case. It looked like this. You have a lateral incisor. There's a deep invagination. You can see the CBCT here and you can see there is a sort of a sac-like structure here and you have the dense tract going in like this and then you have a canal on this side. Initially, I thought it's just one canal but in hindsight, I think it's probably two separate canals. So what I did was I started with the canal itself here. So you can see necrotic canal here. So I clean shaped the canal 
and then I looked for the dense tract here. So I clean shaped the dense tract as well. And then I obturated the dense tract as well as the canal and then put a fiberglass post because it was weakened coronally. And then I sealed it. And in the same session, I decided to do epical surgery there. So this is immediately after obturation. You can see I've made some mistakes. There's still some part of the tract here, you know, so maybe there's a lot of untreated anatomy. But however, I decided to do surgery on the same day. So this is immediately after raising a flap and curating out the lesion before the root end resection. So you can see the gutta cones here. And then what we did was we resected the root first. And after resecting the root, you can see the epical sac or the pouch is here. So I used a ball kind of ultrasonic tip to expose that sac there. So you can see here, that's the dense buried in the sac over here. So I cleaned that out and then filled that with MTA. So it looks like this. So that's the epical pouch, which is filled with MTA. And yes, there is probably some untreated anatomy, but this was the best I could do at that point in time because I didn't know really what to do with this, these sort of cases. And it fortunately seemed to work out at a two-year recall. So you can see here at two years, the lesion seems to have healed, but I couldn't have any more recalls. So this is how I treated this sort of case to start with, where you did the conventional endodontic approach, treated whatever I could conventionally. And then in the same session, we did surgery to clean out the lesion so that we can access that part of the tooth, which we couldn't access through conventional endodontics. So this is one way of doing it. So this is the pre-op, the post-op and a two-year recall. And you can see that it is kind of healing, except you could probably put a question mark here where the bone is formed, but not as dense as in the other areas. But I don't have any recalls beyond two years for this particular patient. So once I shared these cases with other people, especially the people on TDO, I got some feedback. There were others on TDO who had treated these sort of cases, especially Sachin Nalapati from Jamaica. He gave me his feedback and he said that he treated a few of these cases and he found that in the short term when you do surgery, everything is fine. But his experience was that it's always better to do long term calcium hydroxide first, wait for some time for the lesion to heal and then postpone surgery if required. So the next time I got a case, which was maybe two or three years down the road, that's what I did. So this was the case that I got a few years later. You can see again, similar sort of anatomy where you have this dense here and then you have the canals on either side like this and then the dense tract in the middle here and then the patient has a non-vital lesion there. Funnily enough, when I tested this tooth, despite it having a lesion epically, it responded to vital tests. So that told me that the canal is vital, whereas the non-vital lesion is probably because of the dense itself, whereas the canals on either side seem to be vital. So I initially thought I'll just treat the dense and then see what happens. So my strategy was to make an axis like this, clean out the dense and see if I can reach the apex through the dense itself. You know, and then leave these canals on either side as it is because this was responding positively to vitality testing. So that's what I did. I made a small axis, then exposed the dense. You can see here that's completely necrotic there. So I clean shape and put calcium hydroxide and recall this patient. But within a couple of days, the patient called back in the clinic and said she's having unbearable pain. This was a child, by the way. She was probably 11 or 12 at that time. So I went back in. When I removed the temporary restoration, I found that there was a lot of inflammation coming in from either side. So that told me that the canals, which I presumed to be vital, was going in for what irreversible pulpitis. So I decided to extirpate the pulp in the in the canals on either side as well. So I went in there, I did some extirpation of the canals on either side, and this is how it looks. So you have the dense tract in the middle and the canals on either side. I cleaned shape and put calcium hydroxide. And in this case, I decided to do long-term dressing with calcium hydroxide. So I placed calcium hydroxide and left it for a really long period, I think almost a year. And then when we recalled this patient after a year, we found that the lesion had healed completely. I took a cone beam CT and you can see it's completely healed and you have perinatal ligament formed normally. So that's the second way of doing this long-term calcium hydroxide after cleaning out the necrotic part of the dents and the canals. Once we found that the lesions healed, then I obturated the tooth. So you can see here, that's the obturation. So you have the tract in the middle and the canals on either side. And then we put some fiberglass posts as well, two of them, in fact, just to strengthen that coronal portion, just to prevent cervical snap-off in these sort of cases. So that's the post-op. So you can see here, 
that's the tract in the middle and the canals on each side, all of them clean shaped and filled to the apex and the lesions also heal. So this was a non-surgical way. I didn't see any reason to do surgery. So this was a child. I think I treated her when she was 12. And right now I think she's 21 and she still has the tooth. Uh, she's not in Bangalore. She's studying somewhere else. So I don't have a recall, but her mom says that she still has a tooth. Hopefully sometime I take a recall and she maybe the lesion is still you know not there and it's not come back. Because the problem with these sort of cases is that in long-term recalls, you do get short-term success. But the longer you recall these sort of cases, the chances of it failing are very high because there's always some untreated anatomy when it comes to dense cases, which is why another mentor of mine, Dr. Margari, she prefers to remove the entire dense rather than just treating the dense tract and the canals on either side. She prefers to remove the entire apparatus itself. So, this is what Marga does. This is courtesy Marguerite. It's one of her cases. So what Dr. Marga prefers is she prefers to remove this entire dense apparatus as one whole part here. So she would go in there and then use like a Kate's Clidden drill or a Munzburr to completely remove the dense part here. So the entire thing gets hollowed out. And then what she's done, Dr. Marga, is that she put calcium hydroxide here recall the patient and then put MTA for the apex because most of the time the apex is blown out, right? Once you remove the entire dens. And then she strengthened the coronal part with a fiberglass pose. This is a two-year recall, I think. And the respirator was done by Marga's colleague, Dr. Caroline. And it looks pretty good. So this is the other way of doing it. You remove the entire dens. Of course, the disadvantage of doing that is that the tooth becomes weak coronally. But this is what Dr. Marga uh, suggests. So these are all different ways of managing these sort of cases. And I hope that it kind of gives you a clue as to how to manage these sort of cases. Uh, there are clinicians who prefer to do just surgery in these cases because they feel that removing the entire dens weakens the tooth so much that there is no point in attempting coronal portion access at all. They just prefer to manage these cases with only surgery. So I just showed you two cases where one, we did it with a combined approach where he did orthograde endodontics and then followed it up with immediate surgery. And then I also showed you a non-surgical long-term calcium hydroxide management. But there are clinicians who don't do anything orthograde. They feel that why even go orthograde? Let's just do surgery. So that's the other category. I don't have any cases of clinicians who've done that, but I've seen online where quite a few clinicians do just surgery. They don't do anything orthograde in these sort of cases. So I hope that this kind of gives you some options if you get a case in your clinic. Like I said, I've put all this in a PDF and I put the link in the description. You can download this and use it as a reference. If you enjoyed that content, then maybe you would enjoy my weekly newsletter, which is a short email that I send out every Wednesday. It's usually filled with some useful dental and non-dental information. I've put the link in the description below. Do have a look and subscribe to my weekly newsletter called Wisdom Wednesdays. Don't forget to click on that subscribe button so that you get notified every time I upload a new video, which is usually every Sunday. And if you enjoy content like this, then maybe you should check out some of my other videos on this channel coming up over here. I'll see you next week with another video. Till then, take care. Thanks for watching.